Hello, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this second annual Collective Perspectives. This week's discussion is part of our ongoing effort to share the story of our exceptional collection of 18th century Newport furniture. Our Collective Perspectives programming this year is made possible by a very generous gift from an anonymous donor. In truth, the donations from countless individuals and organizations interested in the material culture and history of the 18th century are what allow us to continue our ongoing work at Whitehorn House. So if you're enjoying this program, I ask that you consider making a donation to the Newport Restoration Foundation. You can visit the NRF website, newportrestoration.org, and click on the word support. A gift in any amount is genuinely appreciated. Thank you again for joining us. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Newport Restoration Foundation's second annual Collective Perspectives, a series of discussions about topics related to the work and collections of the Whitehorn House Museum. This year, we're attempting to understand America's cyclical fascination with the material culture and personalities of 18th century British America. In other words, what is the significance of and why do Americans continually return to colonial revivals? I'm Eric Greenberg, Director of Museums for NRF, and it's my great pleasure to host and moderate these sessions. Terrific. So let's go ahead now and begin our program in earnest. Let me introduce our panelists tonight. Tonight's session explores uh, the work of those who have dedicated much of their careers as furniture makers to the revival of 18th century furniture. Tonight's guests are really wonderful craftsmen and in some sense are representative of a whole cadre of people who either professionally or as a quite serious hobby, dedicate themselves uh, to the recreation of historic pieces of furniture. Over the past year, it's been my pleasure to meet with, albeit virtually, a number of people uh, who are interested in this, many of whom belong to the Society of American Period Furniture Makers. And I'd actually like to welcome all the SAPFM attendees in the virtual audience tonight. So thank you very much for attending. We have to figure out a way to get you to Newport next year. Um, so let me begin by introducing Mickey Callahan. Mickey is a furniture maker with more than 28 years of experience making museum quality, custom period, and contemporary furniture. His work has also included the making of custom architectural elements, furniture repair, and restoration. Um, he is a graduate of the furniture making program at the prestigious North Bennett Street School in Boston. And prior to his woodworking and furniture making career, Mickey was a US helicopter pilot, a US Army helicopter pilot, forgive me, Mickey. Um, he holds a BS in electronic engineering from Monmouth University. And he was also employed at Bell Laboratories as a research assistant and um, a telecommunications engineer at IBM. Mickey has been a teacher of furniture making at the North Bennett Street School, along with the Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking in Manchester, Connecticut. And he's currently the craftsman in residence and educational program coordinator at Woodcraft in Walpole, Massachusetts. Mr. Callahan has also written articles for Fine Woodworking Magazine, and his work has been featured in Fine Woodworking, as well as American Woodworker and Woodwork and Woodshop News. In addition, uh, Mickey is the co-founder and past president of the Society of American Period Furniture Makers and served on the Executive Council, its board of directors, until uh, two, up until 2014. He is currently a member of the editorial board for SAPFM's annual journal, American Period Furniture. Welcome, Mickey. Thanks for joining us tonight. And, um, and Steve Brown is a custom furniture maker living on the North Shore of Boston. He, too, graduated from North Bennett Street School's cabinet and furniture making program in 1990 and taught in the full time program from 1999 to present. He worked with Phil Lowe at the Makers of Fine Furniture in Beverly, Massachusetts, graduating uh, between his graduation in 1990 and his return to North Bennett Street School in 1999. His work has been shown in galleries, museums, and private collections. He has given lectures and demonstrations for the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, 
Winterthur Museum in Delaware, Historic New England, and other organizations, including most recently the Whitehorn House Museum, where Mickey came down and did a carving workshop. Now, I, I, Mickey, I'm sorry, where Steve first came, he just came down and, and, and gave a carving workshop. I first became aware of Steve well over a year ago when I read his 2017 piece, Classical Proportioning in 18th Century American Design, which is this really wonderful exploration of the ways in which classical architecture and its geometry had a profound influence on 18th century furniture, which is a work he co-wrote with the furniture maker and educator, Will Neptune, for Chipstone's journal, American Furniture. Steve worked with former uh, North Bennett Street School grad Tom McDonald as an advisor to the show Rough Cut on WGBH in Boston and has appeared in a number of episodes as a guest. Um, so thanks for joining us again, Steve. As, uh, Steve was here exactly one year ago doing this. We know this because uh, this happens on my birthday. And so this is the second birthday that I am spending with Steve Brown talking about furniture. And frankly, Steve, I, I couldn't think of a better way to spend the day. So um, let's let's begin. Um, I have what may seem like a you know sort of silly question. I mean, you could probably do quite well just sort of installing kitchen cabinetry, and you know sort of there's there's enough um, people looking for fine kitchen cabinets across the country, and yet. Um, both of you are really dedicated to creating reproductions of 18th century pieces. So what I'm curious about is why? What is it about creating those pieces that interest you? And why don't we, we'll start this time with Steve and then we'll go to Mickey. Okay. Um, well, before I went to the school in 1988 and, and you know started the program, I had a little bit of woodworking experience, but uh, at the school, uh, so much of the focus is on high-end woodworking and the 18th century designs and techniques are used um, as part of the vocabulary, the main vocabulary for learning how to do custom woodworking. Mm -hmm. So uh, it grew on me as a, you know, as a, the styles that were, uh, we were focused on became more familiar and attractive to me. Um, and I just gained a lot of respect for how well the furniture was made. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just fascinated with trying to um, explore a piece and figure out what the tool marks meant, uh, what the procedure, what the process would have been. Um, it's just a very rich uh, period of furniture making and so it, it doesn't mean that the, the goal that I had or even the goal of the program in general is to make period furniture. Um, the real goal is to make good custom furniture, whatever style. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just such a rich tradition to draw from, you know, stylistically and, and technically. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mickey? Um <clears throat> I kind of agree with Steve. Uh, you know, he sort of stole my thunder there. Uh, first off, uh, we'll uh, let you steal his thunder on the next round. So. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday, by the way, Eric. Thank you very and, much. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, welcome to all my friends at SAPFM, and I really appreciate you having me uh, in this uh, uh, event. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, aside from what Steve has mentioned, uh, you know, when I got into woodworking many, many years ago. Uh, I felt I was lacking uh, the skills <clears throat> that I really thought were necessary to, uh, you know, execute really well-made uh, types of furniture. I always enjoyed woodworking, but uh, furniture making uh, really intrigued me and uh, all the aspects of the procedures and processes that went into it. And of course, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, going to North Bennett really helped focus my attention more to the classical traditional designs. And it's where I sort of uh, developed a, a bigger appreciation for those period pieces uh, that we so enjoyed making today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in my conversation with both of you, 
before because we've, we've we've talked actually a fair amount in over the past few months either individually by email or in group um you know both of you have noted that the, the these pieces these 18th century pieces in particular um are are challenging right they they, they present the challenge that it, that animates you as as woodworkers right as makers um and so i'm curious and this time we'll let Mickey Steele, Steve's thunder, right? Um, I'm I'm curious about what what is it particular, right? Because obviously there are going to be a lot of SAPFM people who know exactly what you mean, but I I'm terrible at woodworking. So what what do you mean? What what are the challenges? What are the things that you find challenging, and that that sort of challenge you in this way that excites you to work on this furniture? So um, what about you, Mickey? Um, I think what. What's challenging is the uh, the whole process from design, uh, which takes into account uh, obviously the aesthetic that you're trying to achieve, but also the proportions and sort of the organic connection that you develop uh, with the various aspects of surface treatment. You know, it could be carving, it could be veneer, it could be any number of things. And uh, I find all that, uh, you know, not only challenging, but inspirational and, you know, connecting it with history uh, it, it was a very important aspect of, you know, learning about period furniture and wanting to make it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Steve? Um, yeah, well, the, the, the different uh, goals present somewhat different challenges, but everything you do, whether it's contemporary, an original design of your own, an original design of somebody else's, or a period piece trying to make an accurate reproduction, you're trying to hit a target. You know, either uh -huh. the target is the piece that you're copying and trying to, you know, achieve a look that, that goes with, you know, what it's, it looks like it's supposed to looks like the other chair if you're filling out a set. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's your own um, design, you're still trying to hit that target. So having having the um, the understanding of the design and and I keep using the word target, um, but then the ability to um, think through what techniques, think through what steps of the process you need to go, you know, uh, to use to achieve that, um, those are those are uh, challenges that a lot of, uh, especially students of mine in the past, and I suppose hobbyists. I think the easiest thing to underestimate about the challenge of this furniture making is the strategy, the the process, the procedure that you need to go through to make it. What order are you going to do things? What techniques are you going to use? How much are you going to worry about efficiency? How much are you going to worry about quality? Um, you have to understand the material, what what it looks like, what, you know, how, how does that affect what lumber you pick or where you pick a piece out of a board can mm -hmm. even make a difference. So there's just so much to think about. Um, it's a it's a mental challenge mm. there's a story that i tell and um it was about a woman who was visiting one of the school shows looking at the student work and she found one of the students and made the comment it must must be nice not to have to think while you work and and that's but that's the impression you're good with your hands mm. as though you're not using your mind and it's just so far from the truth right um, so it's very satisfying that way because you know it's like if you're a, you know if you're in a sport and you're playing another team you want to play the best team and beat them you don't want to you know you don't want to play an easy team and beat them it doesn't have quite the same satisfaction so right. i think the the level of the challenge with this ultimately is also a big part of the um the attraction right yeah, and I, that, what an odd thing for that person to say, right? So I, I've done a limited amount of woodworking. There's nothing to do with furniture. Um, I couldn't possibly do that. That's it. I'm really terrible at it. 
And, and the things that challenged me, uh, there were physical challenges. I'm just, that's not where my skill set is. But the math is so challenging. And, and remembering, like, remembering to take the width of the blade into account, right? All of these things, I, yeah. I'm just struck by how odd, what an odd, odd thing to say to you. Well, if you're watching a master craftsman, they don't look like they're having to think about it. Right, sure. So they've achieved a certain level of, of mastery and, mm -hmm. and they can go through a lot of those steps rather apparently mindlessly. It doesn't look you know, like they're thinking, but they're relying on years of experience. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Phil Lowe was absolutely great at that. He could, when they, he shot a video, he didn't have to think about the next thing he was doing. He just knew what to do. So they didn't have to stop and edit, you know, nearly right. as much. So right, right. You know, uh, I want to keep on this subject of challenge because I got an email from Mickey um, after I had sort of shared questions with you guys that that sort of followed up on this, and I I, I liked it very much. Um, which is, you know, you're not. This, this isn't a hobby for either of you, I think. Right. This is a, this is a career for you guys, mm -hmm. and so there are other challenges that go into doing this kind of work there's market challenges and you know there's uh, you know sort of acquiring wood and there's you know there's finding customers and you know so so mickey since you raised this what are what do you find are the, the those kinds of that that kind of business challenge that you encounter as a maker today um which as you noted when you emailed me was certainly a challenge that 18, you know, the Townsends and the Goddards were facing as well, right? Right. I mean, nothing, nothing's changed in, in all this time that has passed. I mean, they were faced with the same basic things uh, that we face today in terms of trying to uh, not only develop their skills, <clears throat> but also, uh, you know, run a business, basically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as we know, I mean, if you can't run a business, then uh, you're probably not going to succeed unless you, obviously you work for somebody else and, uh, you know, and they get to wear all the hats rather than you, the, uh, the craftsperson. Uh, but yeah, you have to wear many hats uh, in the process, uh, as you pointed out from marketing and sales to negotiating a contract, perhaps with a customer, <clears throat> if you're doing commission work, and, uh, you know, and uh, obviously dealing with other vendors, uh, as far as buying wood and other materials and supplies that you're going to need uh, for that business. So yeah, that's a whole myriad of things that you're faced with uh, if you were to try to uh, actually make a living mm -hmm. doing this. Right, right. I'm just curious, I, I, this was not a question I asked you guys, but I hope you're willing to sort of talk through this with me. Where are you finding your customers, right? So one, one of the things that came up last year in conversation with Jonathan Brower, who's a contemporary furniture maker, is the sort of the ever-present uh, IKEA, right? And and the way and the chat and the way in which um, that sort of sucks the air out of things, and 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 so people looking for good pieces are fewer and far between because of places like that. So where are you finding your customers or how are they finding you? How, are, how is this happening? So uh, Steve, why don't we start with you and then we'll, we'll come back to Mickey. Yeah, we can start with me because it's gonna be really short. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I left school in 90, I went to work for Phil. So I didn't have to drum up any work. I right. just had to do work. Right. And when I left Phil's, I went back to teach full time mm -hmm. for 21 years. So I didn't really have time to take in commissions. So I am just now having to face this challenge. Um, I, I have to say as an instructor, I, I didn't have a lot of experience as you know a person who ran his own business, but I did really try to impress upon students that this is not just for fun, no matter how much you enjoy it, you have to learn how to be um, efficient and proficient. You know, you can't just worry about being so fussy that everything's perfect all the time. You have to get reasonably quick at it so that you can, you can charge people something they can afford. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, I, I don't know where my customers are going to come from. You know, right. I hope if I do enough of these things, you know, maybe I'll, I'll there you it. go. Um, what about, or maybe, maybe Mickey has something that we're going to share something that's going to, to change everything dramatically. Mickey, he's not going to buy any furniture from me. <laughs> so Mickey, where, where, where are you finding your, or how are you, where are you finding your customers or how are they finding you? Well, what's interesting um, about this is that uh, early on, I guess, uh, you know, it was actually more word of mouth um, in trying to, you know, getting, uh, you know, some press, you know, from various media outlets uh, was helpful. I know early on for me, uh, I just happened to be in a couple of cases in the right place at the right time. Uh, certainly having the cachet of North Bennett uh, was very helpful, which, uh, you know, established, uh, you know, a fair, fairly level, uh, strong level of credibility uh, for people to, uh, you know, take a chance with you. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, you know, developing a portfolio. And I think over the years, what I have found is that actually teaching in the manner that I do gives me uh, a pretty good exposure level to at least sensitize people to what I do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we can make the price right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's what it boils down to sometimes. Right. Let's return to this concept of challenging, right? Because um, now, and, and, We'll take this opportunity to sort of look at some images. Um, I'm going to pull up, uh, first I'm gonna pull up Mickey's PowerPoint. And what I want to ask Mickey while we do this, let me go ahead and get a slideshow set up for us. Come on. What I wanna ask Mickey is, if you have it in here, what, what to date, what is the most challenging piece you have? And, and let me just, share with everyone that I'm, for technical reasons, these are very technically proficient gentlemen in making furniture, perhaps less so in um, sharing their screens on Zoom. So I'm going to be going through their slides for them. So <laughs> please, please be patient with us as we do it. I, I, I can only say that every image you see is gorgeous. So stick with us. So Mickey, um, in here, or is there an image in particular? Let me start to slowly move. Well, there's you working on that beautiful uh, corner chair. Uh -huh. um, here's, are, did you make all of these? Yes. Oh my yeah. God. So is one of them in particular the most challenging piece that you ever worked on? Well, I, th I think if you look at what's there in the image, the one on the left, which is a uh, federal period uh, break front, um, that went with a whole dining room suite that I built for a customer. Wow. And uh, what I try to do is, um, is embed uh, various different uh, sort of designs and styles to sort of give it uh, somewhat of a uh, personalization of it rather than copy a piece directly. Uh, I have to say that I, I never really liked doing exact reproductions uh, only when asked. And, uh, and in this case, uh, I was given, uh, you know, quite a bit of leeway. And uh, of, course, of course, you know, there's a lot of shared influence uh, that you see in that piece. Mm -hmm. But I think the, ch the challenges were basically trying to get the proportions right and then finding the materials that really set it off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite stunning. I'm, I'm very curious about, we'll talk in a little bit about where you guys acquire wood in this day and age, because it's, um, I, I know that that is becoming a difficult process. Let's just go through a few more of Mickey's, oh, look at the grain on that. That is stunning. Go through a couple more pieces. If there's one that I come past that you want to sort of comment on Mickey, go ahead. If not, as I promised everyone, each piece, oh, there's the- Yeah, that's the break There's front. the break front, good. Right. Lord, that's beautiful. That is really something. Yeah, that went with a uh, dining room set that had a very large table that I tried to capture 
some of the strong elements in what you would have found and some Duncan Fife furniture. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I actually built 10 chairs of which uh, I think one of the previous slides showed two chairs. That's it. Yeah, I actually yep. built 10 of those chairs. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and that, that chair itself, um, there's something very similar in the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, that uh, <clears throat> allow, actually al they allowed me to come in and measure that piece uh, along with the customer that I had. We both entered the museum and we had uh, a special access to a chair there of which uh, I was able to get some good measurements. And uh, of course, it's not an exact copy, but uh, you know, I did take a lot of uh, uh, liberty in interpreting it, so. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you about this piece because um, one of the things is, uh, you know, that I've really come to appreciate um, because of the Whitehorn House collection are these, these chairs. Um, now, I, I'm curious. First of all, are you? You're, or, I, who's doing the upholstery for you? Because it's really quite stunning. Oh, I've done the upholstering. Uh -huh. uh, slip seat upholstering, from an upholsterer's standpoint, is not that difficult. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a little bit of uh, a difficulty here, given that the uh, the seat is <laughs> curved. Right. You see on the front faces, the front edges. And, uh, but as a slip seat, it's not that difficult. And uh, there was a little bit of a learning curve when I first did this, but uh, once you do it once, um, I was confident that I could do it again. Well, it's really quite stunning. I mean, I, I, and I think I see here what you're talking about, right? Where you are, you're using the 18th century form, but it, it correct me if I'm wrong, but particularly on the back, um, the, the, the back part of the chair. Mm -hmm. It seems more, less committed to that 18th century style. Is that a fair assessment of what I'm looking at? Yeah, I mean, you could you could call this uh, Chippendale. Uh, again, this was my own interpretation mm -hmm. of a uh, corner or roundabout chair. I mm -hmm. really like uh, corner chairs. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've built uh, several of them as uh, as you as you know, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a bit of a challenge to it, um, particularly where the front leg attaches to uh, that serpentine uh, arrangement of the front rails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I just you know felt like challenging myself uh, with a one piece leg for the three back legs. Uh, that's all one piece of wood. There's a turning as well as the shaping of the cabriole legs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So beautiful, really beautiful. Let's um, let's move over to Steve. Um, Want to look at some of his pieces, um, which are quite um, quite beautiful as well. This is you, Steve. Let me get it set up. Um, let's start with this piece. Um, this is the first piece Steve ever made. Got to start at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually the, the, the woman I gave it to, she wasn't a woman then, she was a high school student, mm -hmm. friend of the family. She still has it. This is actually on her wall, which kind of amazed me. Yeah. But um, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, right. it's actually kind of a, it looks a little like a Pennsylvania cupboard kind of right. vibe to right. me. So, and yeah. I was in Pennsylvania, so... Who knew? There you go. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> the next couple of pictures um, are just student yeah. projects. Got it. You have a, a is this is this you or is this a student? That's or is me. this you as a student? Yeah, these were my student projects. So, uh, and this you know this table you know along with what Mickey is saying in terms of taking liberties, um, I wasn't at all trying to replicate a piece. I took elements from. Uh, I, I basically incorporated what I wanted to learn about. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn how to do the, the drop leaves. I wanted to learn how to do um, the flippers underneath, the finger joints, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, some veneering, some inlay. Um, 
the curved drawer. So it was, mm. it was a bit of a Frankenstein. The top comes from a, a Baltimore piece. Um, John Shaw uh, was a maker in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. and that's fairly distinctive for, uh, you know, I, I don't know of any other tops that are quite like that, but no. um, basically it was a learning experience for me. You know? mm. Quite beautiful. What a, what a great learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, and this was something I had made a cradle like this before I went to school. And then I wanted to learn how to really do it. So this, mm. this just involves a lot of funny angles and doing the right. dovetails is challenging. Right. This was just for a friend. Um, Let me see. Now, now, here is the thing that I didn't expect to see when I got the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I built uh, it me, all by myself. Yeah, let me, <laughs> let me share with folks that uh, Steve and I had a very hard time getting his slides. Ultimately, he um, his priority mailed me a thumb drive, which turned out great because th these images came out crystal clear. But you didn't this you didn't work on the you worked on the wood in this car, yes? Right. There you are working yeah. on the wood. Yeah, it, that's uh, this was my second summer while I was still at school. We have the summer off, so this was my summer job, which is you know pretty amazing summer job. But if you go back a slide. Um, oh my goodness! Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, I did the steering wheel. I did the trim around the uh, what they called the windscreen or the windshield, right? And the trim around the door windows, which was uh, very curvy. It mm -hmm. was sort of a kidney shape in in one view, but it curved in every possible you know direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I got this job because a friend of mine had been hired to do woodworking at this place. This place is right in Essex, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. And um, this car was owned by Ralph Lauren. He bought mm -hmm. it, you know, it was a fixer upper. He paid 7 million for it. <laughs> and um, then, then we fixed it up and they sent it out to Pebble Beach, um, Concord de Elegance and it won best in show. There you go. And then it was featured in a MFA show. Got it. So, now, now here you are. Here are other elements of, of the, your work, right? So, yeah. Um, so, I guess my my question for you is, and you may not be able to answer this question, which you know, which is sort of, which of these kinds of work do you prefer? I mean, you know, outfitting Ralph Lauren's car or you know, taking what, what are clearly inspirations from earlier uh, furniture making traditions yeah. and then doing your own work with it. I mean, what is it? Well, is if, it? I, if I had to say, you know, I mean, all of them um, involve the skills, both, you know, mental and physical uh, that are required. And that's, that just makes it enjoyable. They're all mm -hmm. challenging in different ways. Mm -hmm. These handrails, they were a side job, you know, for somebody, for the stair contractor who had gotten the, the overall job. These ends of the handrail had to be completely hand carved, the moldings and everything. So mm -hmm. um, I'd never done it before, but it just, it uses the same skills that you've learned for everything else. It's right. a molding. It's a very curvy molding. Right. So yeah. now yeah. the what's what's coming up next after this um the next for me this is kind of if i had to pick what i did you know all the time this would be wonderful and that is mm -hmm. i had to uh make a chair that matched this set to mm -hmm. live, to live with the set and look as if it was made at the same time by the same guy mm -hmm. um and that was just an extremely exciting challenge if you go to the next picture um that's the two you know the obviously the unfinished one is the one that i did i didn't finish it i didn't upholster it um the person who hired me to do the job was a conservator who had you know gotten the job to conserve the chairs and the person wanted an even number to fill out the set got it so got it. so this was i had to have the chair with me one mm -hmm. of the chairs. and it was just it was a real enjoyable study amazing let me ask you guys i'm gonna stop sharing for a minute i want to ask um you know for those of us 
who are not familiar with this work. Um, and there are a few of us, not everyone is an SAPFM member tonight. And, um, but I'm sure they'll be happy to hear this as well, which is um, when you're making, you know, we're, at the White Horn House Museum, we are interested in 18th century Newport furniture. A few pieces are generally attributed to Rhode Island or Providence, but we're, we're looking at um, this moment in the 18th century. And I'm just curious when you're recreating those, what are the what, what's the toughest issues in that work? What are the the biggest? Uh, I, we've been using the word challenge a lot, but we might also use the word problem or absence or something. What when you're working on these? What what are the issues you're encountering? What about? Let's start with Mickey, and then we'll we'll go back to Steve. Um, <clears throat> well, in today's world. Um, getting you know getting the right material. You know, it's one thing to just go and buy wood. Um, but if you're trying to really make that piece, uh, you know, truly superb, you're out there trying to find just the right wood. And what we mean by that, and I, and I know Steve understands this quite well, is, you know, you might say I need mahogany, but what kind of mahogany, mm -hmm. you know, where does it come from? Uh, you know, can you get it in the thicknesses and widths that you would hope that you would want? And what about the density of the wood? That has a, that is a factor too, that we sometimes look at, particularly uh, if, uh, if we're gonna be doing carving mm -hmm. uh, on those surfaces, uh, you know, will the wood hold the detail properly? Um, and, and if I may make it, let me just ask you, because I think I understand this now, having been at a furniture museum for a couple of years now, when you're doing that, you're looking for fairly hard woods so that you can work on the detail. Yes, I mean, soft wood would be oh, big. Well, it, you know, soft wood has its place, but you know, if you're, if you're talking about mahogany, let's just say I go to the lumber yard and I've got two similar sized pieces of mahogany that I want to compare. I'm going to lift them each up. And obviously the heavier one intrigues me more than the lighter one. Mm -hmm. And it, the heavier one just means that it's got a denser growth uh, characteristic to it. Mm -hmm. And of course, then we got to worry about grain uh, uh, presence and so forth and how it's gonna be used in the piece. And, and also, let's just say if it's a tabletop, do you have enough wood out of that particular board to make your tabletop without having to go into another board, which may have come from a different from another tree. It may have been mahogany, <clears throat> but it may have had a different growth, uh, pro growth properties to it, which is gonna affect its color, its grain, and the way it behaves when you machine mm -hmm. it. Um, Steve, what about you? What are the, the, the big, when, particularly when you're working on these reproductions of 18th century pieces, what are the, what are the biggest issues you're facing? Well, the, the material would be a big one, you know, and the mahogany in particular, because so much of the stuff was made out of mahogany. Yeah. And it's getting harder and harder to find good quality mahogany. Um, other than that, I would, I would be thinking about how am I going to go about making this? Am I going to, you know, I'm not inclined to say I have to make every reproduction exactly the way that they made it. I'm going to use machines to make it more efficient. They right. would have, you know, they weren't doing it because it was romantic, you know, all by hand. That, that's, that was the only choice they had. Right. Um, but I would, I would have to think about um, what is the goal aesthetically is it is it supposed to look um you know have characteristics that would show that it was hand done um but those are things that it's not like something i just need to figure out i need to figure out what the client wants and they may not know what they want and so then you have to educate them about what possibilities there are right. and they may care a lot about that or they may not care a lot about that um so you know, that in a sense, that's a problem 
I don't want to make it sound like the client is a problem, but the, <laughs> you know, just you have to communicate with and under, understand um, what the client knows and wants. I, I've heard stories of clients that insisted on certain things like we, uh, this wasn't a job of mine, but the client insisted that the mortises had to be hand cut because they had heard from some other woodworker that they're better. Well, that's just not true. Mm -hmm. And who, who can even tell after it's together? Right. You know, so that to me was, that was a little opportunity for education. Now, right. if they insisted on it, then maybe they'd have to pay more because it's going to take me longer. Right. So then it becomes an economic, you know. Right. Question. So, um, yeah. But so it's just a matter, mostly I would try to figure out how to get the result I want as efficiently as I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, both of you talked about materials and we, we've talked about materials before. And, you know, we at the Whitehorn House Museum are, are quite aware of the challenges facing mahogany. And um, so I shared with you this question. So you've had some time to think about it um, and you may not have any interest in answering it. Um, which I'll understand, but you know, how are you getting your wood? Where, what, what are the ways in which you're getting wood? Are you having to sort of, you have to give up on mahogany? Do you have, is there a guy you meet out back who has mahogany? You know, how, how are you, how are you addressing, um, trying to create pieces that were often specific woods in an age when those resources are becoming scarce? Um, why don't we start with Steve and then we'll, we'll come to Mick. Well, you know, through word of mouth, through, you know, the internet, uh, through advertisements in magazines, whatever, you find good sources. Um, the best source I know of mahogany right now, every time I talk about buying it, they, they lament how hard it is to get good mahogany. They still have some, but um, it's getting harder and harder. So that would you know, again, that would be something I would shoot for if the, the job called for it. And then I'd be uh, at the mercy of, you know, the market or the availability or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but even some of the other woods, uh, you don't just go to Home Depot and buy walnut, you know, boards that are two feet wide. Right. You know, you have to go to a, a, a place that sells hardwood lumber. Mm -hmm. And... Um, some places are, you know, are known for having really good walnut, you know, so I go to a place in Pennsylvania because I know the walnut is really good from what I've gotten there before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe curly maple, you're going to find that up here in New England a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, you know, you just sort of build up a, a list of places and um, call around and yeah. But sometimes you just grab something that's spectacular if you can afford it at the time for some possible future thing. I don't, I, I, I am not financially set that I can hoard lots of great wood. I wish I was, but um, that's, there may be people doing that <laughs> who can't afford it. Um, I worry about that, but um, not much you can do about it. Uh -huh. Mickey, what about you? How are you acquiring wood and, you know, particularly those scarce woods that are so critical to these kinds of pieces, but so hard to find these days? Well, I have to say that uh, a while back when I was uh, a lot more active, so to speak, in doing custom work, um, I would buy extra, particularly of mahogany, because I knew someday we were gonna be in a situation. I just felt at the time that we were moving towards uh, a situation where it was gonna to get tougher and tougher to get quality mahogany in particular. <clears throat> I actually have some uh, still in my workshop garage here in my house uh, <clears throat> that I protect dearly, although uh, I've been known to sell a few sticks here and there. Uh, and, and it's all about networking too. And that's one thing about <clears throat> the society <clears throat> has given us an opportunity to network 
and find out where other people are getting their wood. And it sort of helps out, uh, you know, in being part of that network uh, to uh, source things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's a constant problem. And, you know, given my <clears throat> current work situation, you know, I have access to wood also uh, that uh, Woodcraft uh, retails. So I get to see, you know, things coming in and sort of get first dibs, you might say, <laughs> before, uh, All right. before, before it goes out, you know, to be sold. Well, uh, don't... That's, 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 you know, not that often, quite frankly. Right. Well, don't share your address. You're in, there's a lot of people who love wood on this uh, call tonight. Um, I, can I just make another comment? Please, Steve. Um, it, it really is something that can hardly be overemphasized, and that is how important good material is for the project. So it's, it's one of the things that I think we can offer people that you just will not be able to get with a manufactured piece. I had a um, pair of boards that were 12 feet long, over three feet wide, and inch and a quarter thick of mahogany. They were consecutive boards out of a log, so they, they matched. And I sold most of it to some students who had a commission that they were working on together to build a dining room table. And I sold it to them knowing now I won't have that wood, but mm -hmm. because the project was worth it mm. you know I, I got paid for the wood but yeah. um i also then gave up having the ability to use it but um it's really it's hard for me to think about building something um that nice without material that it really is worth it right right really interesting i um i want to be able to open up to questions uh, I haven't seen any questions yet, but last year, the society people asked so many questions. I'm waiting to see if we have any. I do have a question if it doesn't come up. And this time of night, typically those who don't want to uh, stick around for Q&A um, start to disappear on us. So let me just quickly tell everyone, um, you know, that we're doing this again next week. Um, the, the, if you sort of think about the scope of the programming, last week we were looking at the producers and consumers of colonial revival furniture um, in the early 20th century. Today, we're talking to contemporary furniture makers involved in uh, a similar, though not identical, uh, process. Next week, we're moving into architecture, and we're going to be looking at um, what I'm calling comparative revivals. And we're going to be working with some scholars who study uh, the Moorish revival of the late 20th century the Mission Revival out in California, with those of you who are New Englanders may still know Dennis Carr, who used to be at the Boston MFA. Uh, he's going to be joining us um, and talking a little bit about that because he's now at the Huntington in Pasadena. Um, and also uh, a young woman, a uh, really wonderful scholar at the University of South Carolina, uh, Lydia Brandt, who um, is doing really interesting work looking at um, Southern plantation architecture in the 21st century. And so we're going to be looking at that. And then the following week, we'll look at what we're now starting to think about calling sort of beyond revival as we sort of think about other ways in which we look at 18th century material culture. Uh, museum people, uh, we have a reenactor from Mount Vernon who's going to be joining us as well. So uh, Caitlin, have you seen any questions? I, you're muted. You're still there. We go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. Sorry, it's the iPad versus laptop thing. Um, no, so I have not seen any questions yet. All right. Well, that gives me an opportunity to ask a question. Um, and I don't know, so, uh, Steve. Are you part of the society as well, or I, I have been. I'm not okay. currently a member, but I'm certainly familiar with a lot of the people that are in it. All right. So I'm. Oh, we have a hand. We had a hand. Did you see it? Someone had a hand up, and now it's gone. Yeah, I don't see it. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, well, um, 
I am really, really curious about the Society of American Theories of Furniture Makers, right? That I, 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 we were practically inundated with responses from SAPFM members last year. And it's in that enabled us to start a conversation with SAPFM members, um, which I'm really interested in continuing. And so I'm curious about, so Mickey, you're the founding director. Is that true? You, you founded the organization? Actually, I'm a co-founder. Uh, uh, there's another uh, fellow by the name of Steve Lash, mm -hmm. uh, who lives out in Michigan. And uh, so, yeah. why? And how? How and why? Why? What was the? What was the impetus behind doing this? It seems like a lot of work, and uh, I'm sort of curious about why one chooses to to create such an organization from from scratch. Um. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. Uh, back in uh, the late 90s, um, there was a program that uh, Williamsburg had started called Working Wood in the 18th Century. Mm. And uh, I attended the uh, very first session that they put on in Williamsburg and, uh, and met up with a number of other people uh, that were professional as well as uh, serious hobbyists uh, furniture makers and literally uh the idea gelled over you know having a couple beers in the lodge at williamsburg uh thinking that it would be nice <clears throat> if there was an organization that would cater to the needs of uh period furniture makers uh enabling them to uh gain access to uh, various venues, museums uh, that house collections uh, so that we could get uh, in closer and uh, up, up close, I should say. Mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously share in, in our experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, there was no organization catering to, to those kind of needs. And uh, so as they say, one step led to another. Mm -hmm. And here we are today, uh, over 20 years later. Mm. with a uh, viable organization nationwide and we have international members as well wow I, yeah it's it's so funny even uh, the, the same is true of academia right that the best ideas have nothing to do with the conference itself but what typically when you're talking about academics it's it's typically coffee um but um but beer would work too it would it certainly um it generates some really, some really good ideas. How, how interesting to see that woodworking conferences are not that drastically different from the American Historical Association or other conferences like that. Hey, Steve, so you've been involved at times. Um, you know, what are the, what have been the benefits of being an SAPFM member over the years? And you're muted. Now yeah. You're not. My screen went dead. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I haven't been a member uh, for more than a couple of years, it, mm -hmm. mostly just because I just don't get around to it. But, um, and I'm just busy, you know, I've been busy teaching. But um, I think, you know, the, the relationships that I've seen, um, you know, I've known people through the, the, um, um organization and uh i just i think there's such a strong interest with the people that have an interest that um the ability to find other people and share information um share your enthusiasm uh share your not just experiences but your your work you mm -hmm. know get get feedback uh, whether it's good or if it's critical um you know i i think that people that are really into doing this they want that they mm -hmm. you know they need that so it's going to help refine their work it's gonna they're gonna get educated more um so you know i i just think you know the, the word amateur you know is appropriate for this field because it isn't just hobbyists it's people that take it very seriously they may right. not be doing it professionally, but right. they care a great deal about it. So, right. Now, two questions have come up, 
both for Mickey. Um, I'm going to go, let's start with uh, Keith or Ken um, asks, Mickey, talk about the cartouche. Actually, it seems more like a command, Mickey, than a, than a request. There's no <laughs> yeah. question mark. So what, talk about the cartouche. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the cartouche is, uh, uh, is an award that, uh, that the society presents every year uh, you know, based on a, uh, a body of work that is seen as exceptional, sort of a lifetime achievement award. And uh, we felt that we, when we or put the organization together, we felt that we needed the uh, so-called Heisman Trophy mm. of period furniture makers. And uh, it's kind of a long story that goes behind the cartouche, but the award itself represents uh, for lifetime achievement and uh, the uh, the recipient who is chosen every year uh, is picked from the group from their peers uh, and uh, you know I'm very proud of the fact that this is what we do and that was another uh, <clears throat> element of uh, one of our goals uh, with the group was to give recognition to people who really deserved it in the field. Uh -huh. And we have another question. It seems a little far afield, but we'll go ahead and ask it anyway because it's getting late, and we'll we'll do one or two more. Um, which it just disappeared. Uh, but the was it answered? No, Caitlin. It said you answered. No, it was a. <laughs> but yeah, the question so, well, is. It... Oh, go ahead, Caitlin. Sorry. <laughs> I was I was indicating that we were answering it live. Um, no, it's just a question about model planes please. Yes, talk about the model planes, in please, the... please, I think was the exact. <laughs> yes, with, with an ellipsis afterwards, so. Right, right, they're serious about it. Well, you know, yes. I, ha I have an aviation background and interest, and uh, it's something I've always done. Uh, in fact, uh, building model airplanes is a form of woodworking. Um, you know, it requires uh, assembly of a lot of light pieces of balsa wood and things. And it's essentially my hobby, you know, because I have woodworking uh, more or less as a, uh, a career, uh, I have to have hobbies. So obviously uh, building and flying model airplanes is one of those. Got it. The, um, the Bugatti, what? the car that I worked on. Yeah was a coach built car, like a lot of the old planes where wow. they were wood framed. Wow. And then it was wrapped in skin, but also the, the aesthetics on uh, that are based on old aircraft construction. Mm. They have the two sides of the bodies are joined together and they have a fin that's riveted together. Mm. Uh, and that was to evoke the old, um, airplane designs, apparently, right. consciously on Bugatti's part. Interesting, you know, that's, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about car design and the way it evokes aircraft design. I mean, the, 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 the fins on, you know, cars from the 50s and their relationship to the space race. Um, but I think that's probably not the conversation to be having for the Whitehorn House Museum. And I think um, it's getting late because I see people starting to go home. And um, it's been a long day for, I'm sure, all of us. Um, but ending the day this way, spending the time talking with you guys, learning about furniture making from this uh, angle, learning the details from this angle is just wonderful. It's great for the work we do at Whitehorn. I think it's great for, for our audiences who come to learn more about this. Um, it's, been, it's been a delight to talk to you guys both before this and on screen with, the, with an audience. Um, I learned so much from both of you and I hope to continue to learn more from each of you as we move forward. As I said at the beginning, I mean it, we have to figure out a way to get SAPFM people to the Whitehorn House Museum for um, something like this next year. So Mickey, maybe you'll direct me to those people and we'll get it sorted out. But again, thanks to both of you. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Caitlin Seller, my continued partner in crime in this work. Um, thank you to everybody who, who attended this evening. 
please come back next week um, and join us for the discussion of comparative revivals. And um, I hope to see you there. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, Eric. Bye. Thanks, Eric. And thanks for the happy birthday, Gail. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Mickey. Take care.